All right, this is a walkthrough for practice test one. It's video 13 of the class. I'm also going to show you some things about the review sheet to help you study for the test. So the test has been available since the opening of class. The deadline attached to it says February 21st, but as I have said before, I have a no fault lateness policy. So if you are late on the test, all you have to do is email me and uh, you can take it without penalty. Once you open the test, though, you have an hour to finish it. The test is open book and open note. I know in the COVID era, a lot of people are switching to modes of online testing that where there's a lot more surveillance and you have to prove that you didn't have another browser window open and you don't have your books open um, and you have to show a second camera to show your workspace. And I understand why uh, that's appropriate for some kinds of classes and some, uh, some disciplines, but it really uh, didn't seem necessary for this course. Um, so uh, the test is open book and open up, right? Um, the one thing I recommend, though, is that you do not uh, just try to Google answers. You want to be looking at notes from your notes from this course um, because uh, things uh, might be, uh, terms might be used differently in different contexts and that sort of thing. Also, I encourage you to have well-organized notes. The process of reading a book like Evicted and taking good notes on it uh, and being ready to answer questions on it, that's a huge part of the educational process right there. Um, so uh, if you do that, I'm confident that you will be learning. So this is the review sheet as you downloaded it. I encourage you to actually use the review sheet to take notes. And before the test, you should actually have notes on every item in the review sheet. That way you know, you, if, you, if you have that, you know you're prepared. So this is a sample of the review sheet with some notes that I filled in in a way that I imagined that you would fill in notes if you were a good student and taking notes. Um, so the first section of the review sheet is on the people in the book and their stories. Um, on my version of the review sheet here, I've got a little paragraph um, for each for things that seem significant about each character, um, and also some page numbers, um, uh, just to be sure that I've got these details right. And that's something that I was imagining you, you were doing. Um, there are five section headings on the review sheet, um, and each corresponds to a pool that questions will be pulled from randomly. Uh, the, the test doesn't pull the same number of questions from each section, though. Um, there will be two questions on the people and their stories, three questions uh, about housing in America, that's sort of the political background, two questions again on critical thinking terms, that is ideas about argument, and then three questions on ethical terms and arguments. And those are that's actually divided into sub pools uh, based on the three major uh, people we are reading, um, Aristotle, Haslinger, and Jung. Um, the, the, those are the three people that we read on justice. Okay. The practice test has the same structure as the real test, but not all the questions are randomly generated. For instance, for the people questions, I just have two set questions uh, that are representative of the questions in the pool that the real test is going to be drawn from, uh, drawing from. However, for the critical thinking sections, um, the practice test is just going to be pulling randomly from the exact same pool and uh, you, each time you take the practice test, you will get new questions in that section. Um, and that's a good way to study and learn the questions that are in that pool. Okay, so let's take a look at the practice test now. Uh, the first question is, 
Which of the following are things that Sharina Tarver does as a landlord? Check all that apply. Uh, and just to let you know, the practices of the landlords is one of the things that I'm going, I think is really important about the people we're following and I'm asking you to keep track of. And then on the tenant side, um, I'm hoping you keep track of the reasons why they get evicted or are threatened with eviction. Um, and I mean, you don't have to keep track of how close they come to being evicted, but just notice what kinds of things lead uh, them to be served an eviction notice or that sort of thing. Okay, so let's look at this. Uh, does Sharina Tarver enforce a strict no drugs policy in all her properties? No, no, she doesn't. Um, we don't see any evidence that she has a no drugs policy, and we certainly see plenty of people taking drugs. So we leave that one blank. Does she allow her tenants to fall behind on rent? Um, yeah, she, uh, she does. In fact, she, um, oh, yeah. So that's one of the things that we see in all of them. Uh, does she, if all of the landlords, um, does she evict tenants in retaliation for reporting building code violations? Yes, uh, we saw in the first chapter that she uh, evicted someone because of a hole in a window. With the, the tenant was never named, but uh, she re the tenant reported that to the Neighborhood Services Commission and she was evicted and then Arlene moved in. Does um, Sharina refuse to evict people if they have very young children? No, she, she doesn't. She evicts people with children all the time. And in fact, one of the things that we are going to see in uh, an upcoming section is that having children actually increases your likelihood of being evicted. Okay, and finally, makes her biggest profit off the properties which are in the worst condition. Yes, this is true. Um, so... Uh, this is actually one of the things that they, she, they, um, Desmond talks about as sort of the business model of the bottom end of the market. She's charging the same rent for all of her properties, but the ones that she makes the fewest repairs on are the ones she makes the biggest profit on because the rent is the same, but her expenses are lower. So, okay, so for that one, we um, choose those three. All right, next. Uh, which are reasons Arlene Bell and her sons are evicted from different property? Uh, one, she spends her rent money on drugs. No, we don't see that. Um, a lot of people take drugs, but that doesn't seem to be one of the problems that Arlene has. Uh, the building her family was in was dubbed unfit, declared unfit for human habitation. Yeah, that's the second eviction in chapter one. Um, a front door lock was broken after Joe, Jory threw a snowball. That is the eviction that opens the whole book. Um, so we check that one. She fell $870 behind on rent uh, after paying funeral costs for a close friend. Yes, that's that one happened. L the last one says reporting a hole in a window of an apartment she rents. That was not Arlene. That was the tenant just prior to Arlene. Okay, let's pause this. Okay, next. Uh, which of the following are true of eviction court in Milwaukee? The ratio of men to women being evicted is about the same. No, it's not. Uh, women are far more likely to wind up in eviction court. And at one point... Um, Desmond says that uh, the experience of being evicted is, um, well, um, one of the big things that happens to women of color in cities, as opposed to men, men get incarcerated. What, what, what he says is uh, black men get locked up, black women get locked out um, because these are two big institutions that disproportionately hurt black people. All right. Most tenants do not have legal representation, but most landlords do. Yes. 
The racial net makeup of the tenants mirrors that of the city in general. No, actually, actually, let's go over, let's go back to the review sheet and we can see this. So um, here's my copy of the review sheet. Um, and uh, so here are the notes that I took. Proportion of people who are black, 75, page 97. Proportion who are women, 75, page 97, right? So all of that is stuff that you should be keeping track of. All right, so uh, is the racial makeup is disproportionately black and most tenants don't show up. So we check those two. All right. Um, which of the following best states Desmond's estimate of the eviction rate in Milwaukee between the years 2009 and 2011? Um, and so one of the important things here is that Desmond makes a distinction between a formal eviction and, in, and informal eviction. Uh, and so one of the things that he discovers is that if you count all kinds of forced moves, when people move under duress, not just situations where the actual landlord shows up and piles your stuff on the curb, the rate of eviction is much higher than you would have realized. So the correct answer here is this one. It's one in eight uh, renters experience some kind of forced move, either a formal eviction or an informal eviction. Okay. Uh, which of the following best describes the difference in rents between high income and low income neighborhoods? Uh, this is another bit that Desmond discusses as part of the model, the business model for the bottom of the market. Um, rents are a little bit higher in high income neighborhoods um, than in Milwaukee's poorest neighborhoods, but not much, actually. Um, and what's keeping people out of the richer neighborhoods generally is not the level of rent, but the practice of tenant screening. Um, and Desmond says that this is true of big cities across the U.S. I'm not sure it generalizes past Milwaukee. All right. So that's questions um, uh, one through five, you had two questions on the characters and three questions on the political background. All of that is material from the book Evicted. Um, the next five questions are from the supplementary philosophical readings. Um, uh, so we've got two questions on critical thinking terms, which was in my PowerPoint and the critical thinking textbook that I had you read a bit of, and then three, uh, three questions about justice from Aristotle, uh, Young, and Haslinger. All right, so um, let's, let's look here. These questions are genuinely random. Um, they uh, are just pulled from the same bank. I've got a really big bank of critical thinking questions because I use this in every course. Uh, let's go back to the review sheet. So, um, right, uh, the review sheet, you've got a few simple terms to deal with when it comes to argument. Um, argument, standard form, conclusion, premise, statement, premise and conclusion indicators. And here on my version of the review sheet, I've filled in definitions for all these terms and made a note about what PowerPoint slide you can find them on. So the question we got this time was give examples of two premise indicator words or phrases and two conclusion indicator words or phrases. So premise, indica premise and conclusion indicators are words like because and therefore. They're used to signal that you are giving an argument. And so what comes after a because is a premise. What comes after therefore is a conclusion. Um, there are lots of words like this in Eng English. So um, I ask you to give multiple examples. Uh, well, let's do premise indicators. Because is the canonical one. That's the biggest one. But there are other things um, that people do to indicate a premise. For is like um, uh, because 
it's kind of weaker though. I um, when I was an undergraduate, I was using four whenever um, <clears throat> I uh, I wanted to say because, and I had a teacher come to me and say, "You think that's a fancier word, but it's not a fancier word. Four is a weaker word. Use because." And I took that to heart, and I've been writing that way ever since. Now, conclusion indicators. Um, so therefore is uh, uh, the canonical one. We can also talk about, uh, we can say something like, we can conclude that, right? I mean, sometimes people indicate that they're drawing a conclusion by just saying, hi, I'm drawing a conclusion. And that counts as a conclusion indicator. All right, question seven is going to ask you to put a passage in, uh, is going to give you a passage and it's going to ask you to put it in standard form. Remember, standard form is where you identify the differences between, uh, identify the premises and the conclusion of an argument. And you uh, take out all the indicator words. You number the premises, you draw a line, you write the conclusion. Um, in ordinary English, the conclusion of a passage can occur anywhere in the passage. It can be at the beginning, it can be at the end, it can be at the middle. It can be in both the, um, at both the beginning and the end. And that's actually a very strong way to write because you, you're putting emphasis on your conclusion, which is good. Um, so, uh, but when you put things in canonical, in standard form, you always write the conclusion last. Okay, so here we've got a little bit of scene setting. Cindy is predicting that spring break will go well. She thinks to herself, if the car breaks down on the way to Florida, that would ruin our vacation, but the car isn't going to break down, therefore our vacation will not be ruined. Therefore is your conclusion indicator word. So whenever you see a passage like this, start by identifying the conclusion. Um, representing arguments, diagramming arguments, is always a matter of working backwards from the conclusion. So uh, conclusion indicator, Therefore, um, and then the conclusion, now let's do this, there. The conclusion is this thing here, our vacation will not be ruined. Um, we're just, re so this character Cindy is thinking and we are representing her thoughts, right? Our vacation will not be ruined. And then there are two premises. We're gonna mark them P1 and P2. Um, if the car breaks down on the way to Florida, that would ruin our vacation. It, feel free to copy and paste here. If you were writing it out um, by hand, I would encourage you to paraphrase, uh, but you need to keep the statements as complete sentences. Um, but other than that, you can paraphrase. But if, if you're doing it on the computer, copying and pasting is fine. Um, you just need to be sure to remove the indicator words. The car isn't going to break down. Our vacation will not be ruined. And um, you can draw a little line here. Um, we'll just do it like that. That's the easiest way to do it. Okay, so there's gonna be one question like that. The passage that you have to diagram is gonna be randomly uh, pulled from a, a, a small a database of questions that of passages that are appropriate for a test like this. All right, distributive and rectifying justice, and we've got a sorting question here. So this was a term from Aristotle. Um, remember, um, well, um, we, I didn't have you read Aristotle. Actually, going back and reading original Aristotle is very. Um, difficult. But we did have an exercise where I asked you to brainstorm some justice terms. And then I, uh, I had a PowerPoint where I talked about what, I, what ideas people associate with justice and then uh, what how Aristotle classifies these ideas, among other things. So the difference between distributive and rectifying justice is that rectifying justice 
deals with what happens when something goes wrong in the ordinary workings of society. So most people's associations with the term justice actually relate back to criminal justice. And that's something that um, <clears throat> Aristotle calls rectifying justice. So here, um, a judge issuing a $10,000 fine is rectifying justice. Um, it actually doesn't just have to do with judges, though. Um, it could just be done with the ordinary running of a household. Um, if I put my daughter in timeout back when she was young for hitting her brother, um, I'm playing the role of a judge in the household. Hitting your little brother is something that goes wrong in the order of the house that we are trying to create. So uh, put, putting someone in timeout rectifies that. Distributive justice has to do with the distribution of benefits and burdens in the ordinary workings of society. So who does the work and who gets paid the money? That's the central question of distributive justice. Um, so uh, actually taxation is a part of distributive justice. Um, taxation takes money from some people and gives it to um, institutions that serve the public good, like LCCC. Um, so it, it is distributing, in this case, education. An employer decides what base level salaries to give. That also counts as distributive. You imagine that the employer is, as a uh, running a company, is running a kind of society, right? And distributing salaries, the benefits of this cooperative process, is a part of that, um, uh, the ordinary workings of that structure. All right. So next up, we've got questions on Hasslinger and Young. All right, so Hasslinger. The Hasslinger essay and the Young essay were two separate uh, essays that I asked you to read that weren't tied to evicted. Um, <clears throat> so this is the Hasslinger essay here. Um, uh, it was uh, social science, social structure, narrative, and explanation, and uh, you remember that this is the one that contrasted two approaches to dealing with things like racism. One was talking about implicit bias, and the other was talking about um, structural injustice. So we can also take a look at this is my version uh, that has notes in it. Um, right, and so if you're looking around for um, an answer to this question amongst your own material, you might have notes like this that uh, can help you. Um, but <clears throat> uh, actually, I think what I'll do is I'll just go to the PowerPoint because I think that might explain things that, uh, more succinctly. So this is the PowerPoint that I put together for this. Um, and you can, so uh, the way I characterized the central argument of this paper was that I had to, if they, that she has two premises, racism, uh, sexism, etc., are primarily social structures, not individual actions or attitudes. That's premise one. We cannot right the wrongs of racism, sexism, etc., by focusing on individual actions or attitudes. Therefore, it's not enough to talk about implicit bias. We have to talk about structural injustice. So honestly, um, these, the, these two premises are the answer to the question. Um, so, uh, and there are other reasons she gives, but those serve as backing premises to these premises. So let's, let's try and paraphrase this, though. Put it in our own words. Um, plus, we don't want it to be not the font that huge. Um, racism and things like that are problems with structures, not individuals. You can change individuals and the racism or whatever 
will still be there. I, I think this is a, a very uh, deep, important point. So we'll just mark this one and two so that we uh, can see. Those are those are the two basic reasons. Okay. Question five deals with Iris Marion Young's essay, The Five Faces of Oppression. Um, and so these are um, ways in which one group can said to be oppressed by another. And there are different aspects of it. And I explain a bunch of stuff in the power in the video about why I think this is a useful approach to things. But right now, I just want to sh show that you, you're, you need to match the definitions. So violence is uh, physical harm directed at members of a group simply because they are members of the group. Powerlessness um, is... Uh, she mostly talks about it in terms of workers, uh, people who who affor are afforded little autonomy uh, in their workplace. But you can talk about it in other situations, too. The point is powerlessness here refers to the ability to structure your own life. It, 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 it's a lack of autonomy. Um, marginalization and exploitation are both about uh, the way the capitalists, the way the economy uses people. Right, so marginal people are um, the experience of uh, people the, the system cannot or will not use, disabled people, other people who are permanently shut out of uh, the work world, for instance. An exploitation is the steady transfer of labor from one group to another, or uh, value, wealth, from one group to another. And... Uh, Cultural imperialism is about the dominant meanings of society, and so when you get these matching questions, um, you can uh, you know you can leverage the fact that you know some of them to rule out answers for others. You understand how matching questions work. Okay, so that is the uh, practice test. Remember that if you. Uh, don't get it done by uh, the due date on it. You can just email me and get an extension. And uh, once you open it, you have an hour to take it. And the test is open book and open note. Okay. Thank you.